Um, he was elected to the Dublin City Council in 2009 and was re-elected in 2014 and 2019. He has served as the chairperson of the City Council's Enterprise and Economic Development Committee, and he is a member of the seven-person corporate policy group chaired by the Lord Mayor. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome the Honorable Paul McCullough to the stage. Can you sit here? Here, sit on that one. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now, we're battling with a little background noise behind us because, as I've told, we have no roof and no wall. So please let us know if you can't hear us just by raising your hand. So I want to start with a conversation around this. We just heard from Ricardo, I think, about how cities are beginning to think of, uh, through sort of the structure, right, this, this methodology for actually bringing smart applications and infrastructure to cities. You're looking at this, too, in Dublin. So I'd like to tell me why Dublin, why smart, and where you're kind of going with this as an elected yeah, official. It's interesting. The last talk was a city nervous system. Yes. But I think we're a nervous city system. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I think every city is nervous about this, too. Yes, yes. Uh, because uh, as you roll out any technology, it creates civic debate. Uh, and as a mayor, uh, you, it's all, uh, politics is all about prioritization, right? right? right. So what is more important to you? What, where does your limited budget go? And what impact does that, does that have? Uh, and so if we talk to everybody in the room here today, they're going to talk, say, smart cities is, is you know, a real top priority for cities. But I imagine if I go to a housing conference next week, they're going to say housing is important and a health conference and so on. So our job as politicians is to balance that, those competing needs. Um, and we're informed by the decision of the electors every five years. Right, right. So... Um, in deploying smart cities, I think that's the first thing that, 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 we, right. need, that we need to think of. So we have, we have a, a great brand in Dublin, uh, Smart Dublin. Uh, we're working across a number of local authorities uh, to try and develop that brand. We're quite lucky in Dublin in that we have a really strong uh, FDI presence right. uh, in, the, in the tech sector and that that's coupled with a really great, innovative um, a startup community. Right. So I think we have a lot of the ingredients. Um, so we have... We've looked at the development of, of, of the rollout of 5G. We've, in our smart Docklands area, we have rolled out a, a small cell cluster, uh, and we're in the middle of that pilot phase. Uh, it's, it is right in the heart of the Docklands, which is where all the tech companies are. So it's not in a disadvantaged community. It's right where everybody believes it should be. So I'm worried about two things, because we're still at review right. stage. Scalability. So how do we go from this small cluster to a citywide uh, program? Uh, and you have two policy influencers here talking to a whole room of engineers, right? right, right. So all these guys are worrying about how you scale it right. in technology terms, right? I'm worried about how we scale it from a city, di from a city dialogue perspective. Right. So I want to I talk about that just for a moment. So in the United States, we have the same kind of conversations, right? There's the uh, development of the small cell infrastructure that's going to require mu much more densified networks, much more propagation of signals, et cetera. Then there's this conversation about civil society and the applications that will roll off of that and how you get your citizens to understand what's actually going on in this process. What have you done to sort of create less tension between the two verticals, between what the technology will require in terms of infrastructure, small cell infrastructure, and what citizens expect their governments to do. Okay, so I think <laughs> one, of the, one of the challenges we found is that working internally, right. uh, the asset owner of the, light, of the lamp pole is our traffic department. Yes, yes. And they're really protective of that uh, for good reasons, right? Because they have their responsibility uh, and they have over time learned what, what they believed uh, the city wants. Right. So they're very protective of it, and it has been one of the real challenges that we have. But as you talk about the, the deployment, right. probably for the first time since electrification, we're going to have such a strong physical presence being rolled out right. on streets. And that's going to force Mrs. Murphy or Mrs. <laughs> Jones to say, what's that plastic box right. on, that, on that pole? Uh, what does it do? How is it going to impact me, and why is my city spending money on it? That's right. That's right. I, I, and I'm not sure 
any city has really started to have that full-blown conversation with, with, with their citizens. Right, and I think it's important. I'm not sure about how many of you are familiar with 5G infrastructure. I mean, we're literally talking about in previous 4G iterations, probably macro towers that you would actually put one in this room and that macro tower could actually do the spread of the type of connectivity that we've all come to expect under mobile. On 5G, we're talking about a tower here, a tower here, a tower here, a tower here. And that, like you said, will be scary to Mrs. Murphy, who's saying, what is my city doing from an architecture standpoint? Is it concern on the beautification side of it? Is it concern on the, the density of these networks? Where do you think citizens are sort of seeing the architecture side of it? And then I want to talk to you about the impacts for citizens. Yeah, so I think there, there's going to be a lot of concerns. Yeah. And sometimes it's easy for technical people to set those aside right. and say, oh, you know, it's just a pizza box. Yeah, right? that's a, that's a, that's a Luddite concern, right. you know, right. absolutely. But as politicians, we have to persuade people yes. on all of our policies. Sometimes we get 90 seconds at a door right. uh, to persuade people that this is a, is a project. So as we roll it out, I believe we, we need to have the conversation around, for example, the ethics of, of, of doing a business. Why aren't we doing it as a public project? Why are we doing it in a partnership? That's the first area of concern. The health concerns are there. I believe they're best dealt with at a national level, with our, our, our communications regulator and so on. Um, but again, that's a conversation that, need, that needs to happen. And as the third one, as you say, is, is the issue around beautification or, or the public domain. Right. And you will be surprised that even the location of a dog poop in <laughs> can set off a public meeting in, in, in an area, right? Right, right? And I think the last one then is the value for money issue, yes. right? When... I'm living like the Flintstones. <laughs> Why are you spending money right. on the Jackson? Keep my Flintstone life, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. but they, they, people just want, they want a home, they want a job, right. they want to be able to get to work. Right. And so this idea of city FOMO, the fear of missing out, right, is what we're, we're all engaged in mm -hmm. uh, so that we, we're not left behind. Right. right. But we have to persuade people it's worth investing in, it's worth spending on. And my biggest concern, and I know you have a lot yes, of concerns in this yes. area too, is that the, it's hardest to sell that message to the most disadvantaged of communities. Yes, 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 you know? yes. So uh, my electorate area has one of the highest opiate uses uh, in Ireland. We've won the highest levels of public housing. We have a very significant uh, area disadvantage. They don't care about 5G. Right. They just don't care about it. Right. And we have to, we have to persuade them that it's important, right? But also, we have to answer their needs with 5G. It's not about rolling out pizza boxes on, on lampposts. It's about the use cases that will improve their lives. And I yeah. still think we have a long way to go to flesh out those use cases. You know, it's so interesting because I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm writing this book. And so I'm going to areas in the United States where there's high rates of opioid addiction, where there are seniors that, you know, don't drive anymore and really ha are staying bedridden, right, because they cannot get care. And I want to talk a little bit about this, particularly for those of you that are engineers and others who are interested in this. There is messaging with this. How, what percentage of people in Ireland do you think actually carry one of these around? It, it, it's very high. We have very high uh, proliferation of mobile phones. We talk a lot in Ireland. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I bring that up because in, in the U.S., as with other countries, we're seeing over 90%, yeah. right? And so can we persuade people to see that this device has to be enabled by something? And even treatment for opioid addiction can come from better networks where you can navigate private transactions from the comfort of your home. Or if you don't have a car, you can still get help. Mayor, is that some of the messaging that we should be giving people in terms of this? Or yeah, but we're are we coming, missing the boat, you know? We're, we're coming from a legacy yes. where these communities don't trust us to provide housing. Uh -huh. They don't trust us to provide jobs. They don't trust us to solve their, their health needs. Uh, so why would they trust us that 5G is going to be good? Yeah. And so I think we've a, it's, a, it's a really difficult conversation in those areas because commercial companies aren't necessarily going to go to those areas first. Right. So right. We, we're going to have to make a difficult decision about ensuring that the deployment covers all areas. But then when it starts in those areas, we're going to have to persuade those people it was worth forcing these companies to, to, right. do, to do it. And I think the way you do that is the use cases. Yes. Uh, it is, is sparking the imagination of communities and saying... Yeah. What can you do? Give them ownership. Help them. And we've, we've done this um, uh, with our beta projects in, in, in Dublin, is go ahead, challenge them at, at what the issues are in their city, and then show them how mm -hmm. use cases can deliver those solutions. That's right. 
but we have to be careful because over-promising is the worst thing you can do as a politician because three years later somebody else criticised you for over-promising and you're gone. And you're replaced with a more irresponsible politician who wants to get rid of 5G, right? right? I mean, going back to Ricardo's earlier presentation, how many of you in this room remember the various iterations of technology projects that we were going to do in cities that somehow along the way didn't, it was a start-stop, right? Because we started it, but the funding or the lack of adoption really stopped us from doing that. But I want to go down to the traffic part of it. You said the traffic department is actually the ownership of the polls. <laughs> Uh, we're seeing a lot of segmentation too, right, by who's actually got to be a part of this process to make it successful. How do you suggest that cities actually bring more coordination among agencies to actually ensure that they can roll this out? Because that's another issue. The traffic department is used to doing stuff this way, and now you're asking them to do something differently. Uh, I was interested when Ricardo was talking about technologies using different languages. Yes. Uh, I've sat in rooms with city officials. They're in the room. There's no technology. They're speaking different languages to each other, right? So uh, this, is a, this is a silo issue that we, that we have. Uh, I'll give you an example. So uh, we have, we're, we're exploring the, the whole area of e-scooters in Dublin, right? Yes. So for climate change, we want modal shift. We want people to use different forms of tra transport to get, out, to get out, out of their cars. Our traffic department is responsible for that. Um, and they, I would say, have a very conservative view on the, on the use of e-scooters in, in, the, in the city. Yes. Why is that? Because that's their job. Uh, yep. Climate change is not their job, right? right? It's the traffic. So I think as, as city leaders, we need to be better at bringing those together. Now, look, that's what we've been doing for centuries. Back to the medieval time, right. there was the one guy that everyone spoke to. Why? Because he was bringing different silos right. together. But I think from a technology perspective, we have to make sure that that happens. Right. A a and that we don't have competing technology. That's right. So I'm getting ready to open it up for questions. So I'm giving you a warning that you'll be able to ask Spare some questions. But I do have something I think that's on the mind of most of us which is what do you believe will be the game-changing application for 5G in cities? You're asking me to predict the next... Yeah, I want you to the predict next, it. The next Uber. What do you, the next... Yeah, right, exactly. Well, we had that, right? 4G birthed ride-sharing and birthed social media. Uh, 5G has the potential to do precision agriculture, uh, more healthcare uh, applications in terms of surgical precision and precision medicine. What do you think for cities, though? will be the game-changing application of 5G. I know I'm putting you on the spot, but no, no, no. all the required well, minds Actually, I suppose for us, <laughs> yes. the game-changer has been the dialogue that starts on, on, on social media, right? Yes. So in my view, uh, Facebook is where my community is, and Twitter is where the journalists are, right? Or where the invested policymakers are. Um, and that has had a profound impact on politics. Mm -hmm. um, Lots of security concerns, right, with, 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 with interference and so on. But it has also had a profound impact in the way we act as poli as politicians. Yes. And um, I think the next uh, game changer for me is when we have technology that allows people turn the conversation into action. Oh, so when yes. we bring community development online. So community development is really important in communities. It's what enables change. Mm -hmm. It's youth work. It's uh, education. How does technology provide that platform that, bri that brings us online? So we're doing lots of, we're doing lots of uh, exploring in that area, but I think that's where the, the game changer will be. I mean, that is so interesting for somebody who's been doing this, like many of you in this room. If you all remember, the game changer, if we would have sat on the stage about 10 years ago, was how to find potholes, right, in your community. The game changer might have been something around putting benefits online. Being able to change the nature of conversation speaks a lot. Because I think, as you mentioned, as we heard in the previous conversation, we don't have the silver bullet on how to get people to adopt technology the way we think we do. So, and don't forget, politics, yes, democracy, is, is sliding towards this simplistic, non-expert mode at the right. moment, right? And you, you, you're a little bit more familiar with the impact of that in the United States, but I wouldn't underestimate it in Europe. Yes. Populism is on the rise, mm -hmm. and, and a feeling of nostalgia for the past and yes. how great it was in the past is being exploited by those on the, on, on the populist right. And we have to make sure that whether it's climate change or rollout of technology, right. that we bring the basic needs of people with us. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't, as I say, there are people out there ready to squash this and say we don't need it. And the public domain is no longer the town hall, right? No. It's no longer in the forum, yeah. no longer in the plaza. It's actually being debated and, and discussed online. Yeah. yeah. Very, very key points. 
Okay, I want to take questions in our time because we can continue to talk and I will actually hog that time. Go ahead, sir, if you can go up to that microphone. I got, I got, to, I got to actually say, we have Nicola Graham from our Smart Cities program here. So if I get a really technical question, I got to go to, I got to, go to Nicola. <laughs> no, no problem. Too many engineers in the audience. No problem. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Shiglov Andre. I'm from uh, Moscow uh, Government IT Department, and I'm so Smart City Lab. And uh, I have a very special question. I know uh, in Dublin uh, there is a bench of uh, world famous companies um, Microsoft, Intel, Airbnb, and so called uh, uh, Silicon, uh, uh, Silicon Bench, if my memory serves me right and uh, how you as a uh, Lord Mayor uh, works with these uh, technological companies. So what is the model of working with them? Uh, for example, in developing 5G, or do you prefer, for example, local Ireland companies uh, to develop it first and then uh, on uh, the second rate, uh, the uh, giant companies like Intel, Microsoft, and so on. So what is the business model of development uh, smart city solution for development 5G, for example. First, local companies, and then uh, uh, first, international. Uh, international yeah. yeah. yeah well, first of all, because of the way our economy is based, I regard Microsoft and Google as local Irish companies, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I suppose it's the balance of the two. Uh, and what we've done is, is and it, I said it at the very beginning, we have the, this benefit of this large tech sector in Dublin and the leadership that's there, uh, often European-wide wide leadership, and then we've the, 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 the startup clusters uh, that, that, are, that are being really innov innovative. So actually our Smart Cities team is really good outside of the change of politicians mm -hmm. in creating those relationships. Uh, and so when I, when, I, when I started in June, you know, there's already huge work done with the, with, with the tech companies. And it's done in two ways. I think it's done around mentoring, support, and leadership from the larger, from the larger companies. But then in terms of implementation, the, it's often done with, 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 with the smaller ones. And in all of this, we can't forget public procurement. It's probably one of the biggest issues that cities have yes. in terms of fostering innovation and creativity is that public procurement, particularly European public procurement, is very restrictive. Um, and so sometimes we can be more agile and uh, respond with the smaller companies right. than we can if it's, if, it's a, if it's a larger company. And it also involves that eth ethical concerns yeah. from other elected members. So it, it's a balance of both, but I'd say they fall into provision by the startup and uh, leadership and mentoring and facilitation by the, by the larger Right, ones. and I would assume based a follow-up on that question is, the multiplier effect though, with regards to whatever partnership you use, still has an output of jobs as well as the indirect effects of having 5G locally, right? So if your local companies may not be involved, you're still gonna generate a number of, you know, we're gonna need people to install all of those small cells. Yeah, right? and I think universities are having a role to play as well yes. in, that, in that conversation, a lot, they, they, uh, a lot of research. So uh, as part of the dense air project in the, smart, uh, in the Docklands, it, it's unique, first of all, it's, it's sort of a carrier of carriers. It's neutral host, which is really important because, uh, and the last thing is, is that it's a connection of research public sector and private sector. Right. So it's those three combinations together. Right. Any other questions? I've got time for one more question. One more question. We've asked them all. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. That's when you actually uh, have a really good conversation. People are like... Most, most town hall meetings we do end with people standing up and walking <laughs> yeah. out. So it's, it's good when so we So we're actually doing well for the mayor here, right? <laughs> He's like, I actually am in a safe place where people like me today. Right? Um, first of all, all your questions, again, the mayor will be around uh, to answer those questions that you have. Uh, we are about to break for a moment, but if you would mind just uh, joining me in welcoming and thanking the mayor again for his conversation. Let's give him a round of applause.